uh, emotions. You know, it was interesting because Nancy and I were talking. I mean, we have done Daniel fasts before, but we've also done like juice fasts and water fasts and that kind of stuff. Been a little while. But, uh, you know, Nancy said, it's it's starting to feel like a fast. And, uh, you know, when you deny yourself certain things, it's like you, you can feel full, but you don't feel satisfied. And it brought up an interesting conversation because, you know, the question came up, are hot dogs really meat? (laughs) Now think about that one for a little bit. Does soy filler count as meat? You know, hallelujah. Yeah. I don't know why I said that, but it was funny. I, we laughed about that. <laughs> Title for the message this morning, Rivers of Revival. We are contending for revival. Whether you're fasting with us or not, you can start today if you want to join us. How many of you are grateful that we're just about on the downhill side of this? Amen. It's like we're at the peak. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's been interesting to... Uh, to, to, to just just converse. I realized Friday night we were around here and there were some other people. And, you know, right now I'm not the most popular person because I called a fast. And that's okay. You know, y'all can bless me however you want to. But, uh, you know, it's, it's a voluntary thing that, uh, that we're doing. And yet I feel like God wants to position us as, as his people to be an instrument that he would utilize to bring revival whatever that looks like, whether that's here or whether that's in this community, whether it's an intercessory kind of way. But we really do want to be positioned to be and to do what God is calling us to be and to do. I want to talk this morning about rivers of revival, and I want you to turn to John 7. John 7, starting in verse 37, it says this, On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, Let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But he spoke this concerning the spirit whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Let's pray together. Father, I ask that you would give us ears to hear what you're speaking to us individually. And Father, give us ears to hear what you are speaking to your church. I ask, Lord, that the seed of your word would be placed in our hearts and that our hearts this morning would contain good soil. And, Lord, as we apply your word and let it grow in us and take root in us and become strong in us, that, Lord, the result would be blessing, but, Lord, also fruitfulness for your kingdom, that you would be glorified, that you would be magnified. Lord, I pray and ask that you would send revival to each of us individually, that you would make the dead places alive in you, And, Lord, that you would bring revival to this congregation, that it wouldn't be something that we simply observe looking in on, but that we would be participants in, that we would be transformed, that we would be changed, that this body would be transformed, that this body would be changed, that, Lord, you would be able to utilize us to bring revival to Sarasota and to Venice and to Bradenton and to Lakewood Ranch and to Palmetto and, Lord, all up and down the southwest coast of Florida. Lord, we look and we see so many people that need you. So many people without hope. So many people without life. And Father, we also acknowledge that apart from you, we can do very little. But Lord, with you, we can do all things because you strengthen us and you empower us. And so Lord, we say, yes, we need you to move in our midst. We need you to move in our communities. Lord, we need you to move in our cities. We need you, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus, come. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Jesus finds himself at the Feast of Tabernacles. And his brothers want Jesus to go with them. And Jesus declines. There's some persecution issues that he's dealing with. And he says to them, my time has not yet come. And so his brothers go on up to the feast and he stays behind. But a couple of days later, he goes to the feast, but he goes in secret. 
Now, when he gets to the feast, he just begins to listen. Nobody knows he's there. But he just kind of inserts himself, stays on the fringes, and he listens to some of the conversations that are going on. And the interesting thing about it, they're celebrating the Feast of the Tabernacles, but the conversation is about him. The conversation is about Jesus. And some of them think he's just the greatest thing that ever happened. And some of them think that he's evil. Some of them think he's good. Some of them think that they wonder why in the world he hasn't come yet. Because they were expecting him to come. When I was in, my, in 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, I went to a lot of rock concerts. Anybody identify with that? Hallelujah, classic rock, nothing like it. Thank you. We would go to rock concerts, and, and, and we'd stand in line, seemed like forever. And then they'd open the doors, and it was general seating or standing, whichever it was. And so everybody would go in and wait. It's like you wait and then hurry up and then wait some more. And, and, and we would go into the, the concerts, and you'd start talking about what was going to happen and what wasn't going to happen. And then they were supposed to start playing at like you know, 9 o'clock at night or whatever time it was, and, and they didn't start playing, and then what's going on, and why is it, and, and, you know, this band is really, really great. I don't like this one anyway. I don't know why I came, and, you know, and they start to talk about what should have happened or didn't happen. That's what was going on with Jesus and this group of people that had gathered for, to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. He was the entertainment. People were showing up to find out what Jesus would do, what kind of miracle he would do, showing up to find out how the religious leaders would interact with Jesus or shut him down. And so they were there for the show. He listens to what they're saying about himself or what they're saying about him. And the Bible says that midway through the feast, Jesus began to teach. He went to the synagogue. He began to teach. He revealed that he was there. And the people began to listen. The Bible says that they marveled at his knowledge of the law. See, they knew that Jesus had never formally studied it. And yet he taught as one with authority. They grasped the wisdom of what he was speaking how many of you know that it's a gift when you can take things that are complicated and make them simple so that something complicated can be understood? Jesus had that kind of a gift just to cut through everything and say, well, this is what it means. This is where things are at. And so people are receiving. The religious leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they don't know what to do with Jesus. Because he's teaching, the people are feeding on what he is teaching. And they realize they're kind of between a rock and a hard place. They want to stop him, but they can't because they're afraid of what the people will say if they go in and shut down his teaching, shut down his meeting, so to speak. But they also don't support him. They're not for what he is saying because it goes against their traditions. And the Bible says that as he taught, many people... Come to believe that Jesus is the Christ. And so on the last day of the feast, the culmination day, Jesus makes a declaration concerning himself. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has stated, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And then... After saying this, he explains what it is that he said. And he uses a metaphor. It says, he spoke this concerning the spirit whom those believing in him would receive. In other words, Jesus says, okay, receiving the spirit is like this. It's a metaphor. Something complicated to help people to understand in a simplified way. When I grew up, got my driver's license when I was 16, I was at the DMV the day of my birthday because I was ready for freedom. How many, how many got your license the day you turned whatever age it was that you could in the state? Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting. I don't know why it is. It's just one of those things I've observed that people that are my age were ready to get out of the house 
and younger people, not so much so. That's okay. But it was interesting. We would drive, and we would just go out and drive because it was fun. When I grew up, I grew up in rural Virginia, and, uh, and, 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 and the roads, metaphor here, were like a roller coaster. The back roads, they were about big enough for a one and a half cars. And they were, it was like hilly. And they just kind of went wherever. And so you'd have these hills that would go and they'd curve. And then you'd get to the bottom and come up and down. And every time you got to the top of a hill, you had to get off on the shoulder. Because if you didn't and you met somebody coming on the other way, it wasn't all real good. And you just learned that for, you know, survival. And, um, and so, you know, driving is like a roller coaster. That's a metaphor. Jesus said receiving the Holy Spirit is like taking a drink. He uses a metaphor. He says, when you come to me, you can come to me and drink. And that's the way that you receive the Spirit. This declaration that Jesus makes about this encounter has three parts that describe how the Holy Spirit operates in us as believers. He says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. So let me give you an invitation this morning. Are you thirsty for more of God? Are you thirsty for more of Jesus? Are you thirsty to go deeper in him? Are you thirsty for a new experience, a new uh, expression, if you will, of the Holy Spirit moving in and upon your life? See, one of the things about fasting is it sharpens our spiritual senses. And we can begin to see not only with greater clarity where God is leading us, but perhaps where we ourselves fall short. And many times I believe God wants to, us to understand where our lives are and where he actually wants to take us. But he says, you don't have to get there by yourself. He says, if you will come to me, if you're thirsty for more of me, I'll give you a drink. And Jesus invites us to come and to receive. And the way that we receive that is by faith. It's not like we come and wait for something to happen. We come and we say, yes, Lord. It may be you feel something, maybe you don't. But you simply say, yes, Lord, I receive what you have for me, Lord. I drink of you. I thirst of you. I come to your water, the living water that you offer, Lord. I come and I drink of it. I receive it. I receive you into myself. And as you receive that, manifestations then follow. You and I drink. Leave the rest up to God. But when you do that, you put yourself in a position where God can pour into you. And he touches the deepest parts of your life. He brings healing to your body, brings healing to your emotions, healing to your soul. He can bring deliverance in areas that need to be delivered. He brings strength where you're weak. He brings things that you don't even know that you need. And he touches you. And you go away and you realize things are different. I'm not the same as I was yesterday. And you have this realization that God is at work and he's doing something. And maybe you begin to hear and listen and sense God communicating with you in a deeper way that has never happened before. Or maybe he gives you dreams that begin to start when you receive that drink that he has to offer you. But you begin to know that something has happened. And so this morning, I want to invite you to let the Holy Spirit pour into you. That if you will put yourself in a position of saying, Jesus, I want more. God, I want more of you. Holy Spirit, I drink of you because I thirst for more of what you have to offer. I need more. I desire more. If you come with that kind of a heart, God will not turn you away. But he will give to those that thirst. The second part of this declaration says, he who believes in me. In other words, this is not something that you can simply look at and observe and say, well, I think I'll try this. 
I think maybe I'll sample this a little bit. Maybe I'll observe it for a while and let's see somebody else. You'll miss what God has for you. I think many of us are in that kind of mode sometimes. We talk about wanting revival, but we ourselves don't want to be changed. So we want somebody else to be re- God, send revival to him. You ever prayed that prayer about your husband? God, send revival to her. And we miss what God wants to do in our lives. Because we're simply standing back, trying to, wanting to observe something that God wants us to participate in. And we all do this. I remember going to to Toronto, up into the Toronto Blessing in the mid-90s, to Brownsville. Part of what I wanted to go was because I wanted to see what was happening. Can anybody identify with that? I want to go where God is pouring out so that I can see God. And so I go, and it was it was good. There was nothing wrong with what was going on in that regard. But it was like, you know, I kind of missed what God wanted to do in my life because I really wanted to observe what God was doing on somebody else. And so I observed manifestations but missed my own heart transformation. How many of you know that it starts with a heart? That's why it starts with Belief. We have to come, we believe that God is who he says he is. It says in Hebrews eleven six, 6, without faith, it is impossible to please him, God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, that he actually exists, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Seeking God doesn't make sense to our natural mind because we're seeking something that we haven't seen with our physical eyes, something that we haven't necessarily felt with our hands, but we're seeking something that we believe exists. Now, as we believe, as we engage in belief, there's manifestations that happen that confirm our belief, but they don't start there. Yeah, I've seen people that have experienced healings, literal physical healings. Their legs are healed. Their back is healed. Cancer is taken out of their body. It doesn't equate to their belief. God will do miracles sometimes, and yet the miracles don't don't guarantee that that person will then serve him. I've seen people that have actually prayed for other people to receive healings. Other people to receive miracles and having God move and two, three years later, that person is backslid and they're back in the world. Why is that? It's because miracles in and of themselves don't necessarily touch our heart at a heart connection and a relationship with the spirit of the living God. And so it starts with a relationship first. That is the foundation. Then we can move into what God has for us in the realm of the supernatural. And so I ask you another question this morning. Do you believe that Jesus is who he claims to be? That he is literally the son of God made manifest, if you will, or visible on the earth? Do you believe that he is your savior? That apart from him, we all will die and deserve that death. But with him, we will live. Because that's the gospel, that he offers forgiveness for our sin. He offers healing for our body, that he is who he says he is. Do you believe? And not only intellectually with your head. Because we can all give an assent to believing in who Jesus said he was. But do you believe it in your heart? Because of an experiential walking and relationship with him. Through the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. See, it starts with belief in God, not testing God's ability. Now, we all may go through these things and say, well, am, do I really want this and is this? But, you know, at some point we have to settle it in our hearts and in our minds that, you know what? I believe that Jesus is who he said he is. I'm all in. I'm not going to go halfway. I'm not going to go part way. I'm not going to stand and wait. I'm not going to observe everything else. But I am going to be one who is in love 
for Jesus, passionate about him. I'm going to go for him. I'm going to give my life to him. I'm going to give my life in service to him, whether I'm rich, whether I'm poor, whether I'm blessed in worldly sins or not. We have to make that decision. Because when you make that decision, then it says that other things, some things we can't do, other things we need to do, you order your time, you order your, 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 your motives, your attitudes, all grow out of that decision. The third part of this declaration says, out of his heart, the person who drinks of the Holy Spirit, the water, if you will, that God has to offer, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. See, what God has poured into you, he wants to also pour out through you. That it doesn't end with you receiving the drink that God has for you. It doesn't end when you receive the Holy Spirit. Because he wants not only the Holy Spirit to be in you, but the Holy Spirit to flow through you. And there has to be an outlet in our lives or else we as believers grow very stale very quickly. If all we're doing is pouring in, we simply become self-absorbed narcissistic Christians where all we can see is our own navel and all we're concerned about is me, me, me. We become consumer-oriented. What's in it for me? Why should I come to this meeting? Well, what's in it for me? Why should I be a part of this congregation? Well, what's in it for me? Why should I do this job? Well, what's in it for me? And we become very self-focused because we've missed the whole purpose for God pouring into you is so he can pour out through you and touch other people's lives. We find our life, the Bible says, when we lose it in service to him, Christ. We take up our cross that he has given us. It's not a cross that we would choose necessarily. It's a cross that he has chosen for us. And we bear it. Why? Because he wants to pour out through us. Life in, life out. Holy Spirit poured in, Holy Spirit poured out. From the deepest parts of you, Jesus said, will flow rivers, not just of any kind of water, but living water. Rivers. And again, it's a metaphor to the Holy Spirit being poured out through us as believers. It all happens by faith, believing in Jesus' ability and power to minister to us and through us. Let me ask you a question. Tuesday evening, you go to a party at your office. Or you go to a gathering of friends, not a holy party, a pagan party. When you enter that room, do you go with the understanding that you carry the presence and the power of God within you? Whether you go there to minister or not, because the Spirit of God is in you, He goes with you into that place. Do you realize that? And I'm not saying you have to witness to them, evangelize them, anything. I'm just saying because you're there, God is there. Do you go with that understanding? Do you realize that God just doesn't come because we're together here on Sunday morning? That you carry the very presence of God because you are a son or a daughter of God. Because he's placed that presence in you. Because at some point, you probably wouldn't be here this morning unless you made this decision. At some point in your life, you said, yes, Lord, I drink of you. I receive you. And God took that prayer seriously and he inserted something inside of you. The spirit of the living God came to reside in you. So now wherever you go, whatever you do, he is there. And he intended for it to be that way. See what God has poured into you? He wants to pour out through you. And so when I talk this morning about rivers of revival, 
When you come to Jesus and drink, you receive the river, if you will. You receive his flow, the flow of his spirit. You receive streams of living water. Whatever words you want to use, and there's quite a number of things, ways that the Bible describes the flowing, the power, the, 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 of the fire, if you will, of the Holy Spirit. Whatever word you want to use, when you come and you drink of God, that's what you receive. And when you receive that river, it begins to work and bring life to the dead parts of us, to the parts of us that are not alive to the purposes of God, to the parts of us that need to be revived. It's not that you need literal life or you wouldn't be here. You'd be dead. But some areas of our life are spiritually dead because we've sectioned them off and we've said, God, you can work in this one, this one, this one, but Please, I don't want you to work in this area of my life. God, I don't want you to define what I can eat or can't eat. God, I don't want you to define well, I can, how I can, uh, I don't want you to define, God, how I can express my sexuality. God, I don't want you to define how I can, what I can and can't do. Or, you know, I, I want to live my own life, but I still want you in parts of it. And effectively, there's parts of our life. You may have given your life to the Lord Jesus. You are saved. But there are parts that you have sectioned off that are dead unto his purposes. How many of you know that God wants to bring life to those purposes as well? That he wants every part of you. That the river of God, it really literally is like water. I mean, how many of you can section off water for very long? You see pictures of these floods that come through, like the Mississippi and stuff, and they put these, these uh, have you ever thought about this? They, they put like the, 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 the sandbags, and they pack them, stack them up, and stack them up, and stack them up. And you know that works for a while. But what they're counting on is that they can keep the water out until the water goes down. But what happens when the water keeps rising? And see, water will get everywhere. And when you open yourself up to drink of the Holy Spirit of the living God, that water, his water, his living water touches every aspect of your life if you will let it. Say, yes, Lord, just yield it to him. Maybe immediate. You say, yes, Lord, and boom, something happens. Sometimes you pray a prayer and you see the answer the next, the, in the next hour or two hours or five hours. Sometimes it's the next year. Sometimes it's immediate. Sometimes it's progressive. But when you pray in sincerity, seeking God, he is a rewarder of those who will diligently seek him. And you become a river of revival. I was traveling back from, and I don't know where I was traveling back to, but I know I was coming home. And I was thinking about these kinds of things because one of the things, the passions of my heart has been to see God move. And I realize it's not just about saying, God, I want you to move and, and then me doing whatever it is that I want to do. But God, I really have had a heart to say, Lord, I want you to use me to bring revival. I want you to use the giftings and the purposes and the anointings that you've given me to, to see you move into a community or a people or an area, a city, whatever it is. I began thinking about that and I stopped at a Denny's. I'm talking about food and we're fasting. Hallelujah. I got me a, a, I think it was a $2.99 Grand Slam. Eggs. Eggs are good. You can eat eggs. And, uh, and, 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 and I, I wrote, I remember the Lord spoke, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. He said, if, if, he said, take your hand. If you will take your hand and simply reach it out. And, 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 and I got this vision of, of praying for someone with my hand on top of their head. It's just about like this. I said, God, and the Holy Spirit said, just, just allow me to pour through you. And it's like my hand was a faucet. And I wrote this, I, I, well, in my own artistically challenged way, I sketched this out, okay? What that looked like. It looked like a Dr. Seuss book, but anyway. And it was, it, it was you know, this, this thing. But, but, but the, it was very real. 
And so since that time, when I go to pray for somebody, like I'll be sitting in, uh, in, in the office and doing counseling or, or, you know, we'll be doing inner healing with someone or something like that. When, when that kind of gets to a certain place, I always like to pray blessing into that person's life. So that the parts that, uh, that they have submitted to the Lord, that God can begin to fill them and, and minister to them. And so I'll go over them and say, hey, can I pray for you? And they'll say, they always say yes. And so I'll put my hand on their head. And they're sitting down. And I'm just kind of you know, putting my hand on their head. And I just say, Lord, pour into them. And many times I have this, get this vision of seeing oil just very slowly. Looks like honey. Just begin to pour down their head and on their shoulders, and, and just, just kind of begin to consume every aspect. And it's, a, it's symbolic. It's not just their body receiving the Holy Spirit, but it's every aspect of their life receiving what God has for them. See, I believe God wants to pour out on us. He wants to pour out on you. The things you've experienced to this time, I believe He wants to go so much further if we will allow Him to. He wants us to experience all that he has for us. Because you see, the Holy Spirit has been given so that we can become co-laborers with him. A source of Holy Spirit ministry, a place of Holy Spirit's power. A person who imparts the life of the Holy Spirit. Our ministry is not in the church. Our true ministry is the people that you meet whether you're working out there, whether you, are, you go to 7-Eleven and get coffee, whoever you're working out with. I mean, our, our ministry is not to, I mean, this group of people, yeah, we need some ministry, okay? Some of you need more than others, hallelujah. But there's so many people out there who have the needs that if we would simply allow ourselves and take the risk to say, Lord, I drink of you so that you can pour out through me. Show me where it is, who it is that you want to touch because I will be obedient to simply pray, Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, minister. Holy Spirit, heal. I mean, that's, that's not a real hard prayer to pray. You don't know what to say? That's fine. Don't say anything. Can I pray for you? You know. Holy Spirit, more. Holy Spirit, come. Just touch this person. Minister to this person's need. And you do that by faith, but you begin to see the manifestation in reality. So this morning, I have a very simple invitation in some way. I want us to stand. And if you're thirsty... I want you to take a drink, to stand and drink of the Holy Spirit, to receive from Him. Some of you this morning need to drink of the Holy Spirit in His presence. You need to drink of His provision for you. You need to receive it. You need to drink of His healing for you. You need to receive it. You need to drink of His guidance and His direction. You need to receive it. Many times there's very real needs that we have that we come but bottom line, we come with our lives because we need the refreshing that the Holy Spirit has. If anyone would thirst, let him come. Let that person drink. And so if you thirst this morning, I want you simply to raise your hands to the Lord. We're going to begin to worship, but this is kind of going to be a progressive invitation. Just say, Lord Jesus, I receive. Holy Spirit, come. 
Lord Jesus, we receive. Holy Spirit, come. Touch me. I receive of you. Just, just allow the Holy Spirit even to give words to your prayer. I need you, Lord. I need you, Holy Spirit. Touch me, Lord. Let's just start to worship. Just continue to receive. Just receive. Drink from the Lord. I'm humbly I confess.